Second, I just want to touch on the title for a second. If you have an ESV Bible, which is typically what I'm preaching from, um, it says Acts of the Apostles. Some of your translations might say the book of Acts. Um, I, I take a bit of an issue. It's not inspired, but I take a bit of an issue with the title, the book of the apostles, uh, because this is actually a book of Jesus working through the apostles, and there's a difference. There's a difference because if it's a book of the apostles, um, at least one apostle should be named throughout the whole book, but it's, it's just not the case. In fact, uh, the first 12 chapters, Peter, now other, others are mentioned, but Peter is heavily mentioned. And then you get to 13 to 28, and then Paul is heavily mentioned. So neither one of them is mentioned in all 28 chapters, but you know who is? Jesus is. And so th- this, is, this is the acts of Jesus through the apostles, or the acts of Jesus, better yet, the acts of Jesus through the church, through the church. And what I don't want you to do tonight is I don't want us to go through the book of Acts and you disconnect your personal life from the book of Acts. I don't want to go through the book of Acts and I don't want us to disconnect the church from the book of Acts. The reason I got chills when I got to the end of the the, the book is because I realized that what God did was at the end of chapter 28, he passed the baton to you. He passed the baton to me. And I'm I'm, I'm saddened a little bit because I realized if he passed the baton, then that means the same work that was going on in the book of Acts should be going on in our lives. The same work that was going on in the book of Acts should be going on in our churches. But oftentimes, there is a disconnect between what we see in the charisma and the power and the, and the boldness of the apostles. There's a disconnect with what we see in Scripture and book of Acts and what we see in the church. All right, let, let's get to verse one. I'm literally going to go through each chapter. So y'all just kind of, y'all just rock with me for a little bit. Give me a little bit of time tonight. And um, man, I, I really think that this, this book is going to bless you. Uh, Verse number one, there's a word in here that I want you to pay attention to. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, he's talking about the book of Luke. He says, in the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So he's like, look, in the book of Luke, when when I wrote that book, it was all about what Jesus did and what he taught. But here's how I know that the continuation of the baton was passed to you, because in Luke, it's what I what Jesus did and taught. But in the book of Acts, it's what Jesus does and teaches through the church. And so what you see, because nowhere in the book of Acts, Acts one, you see Jesus there, but it's right before he ascends. He's already died. He's already risen from the dead. And if you know uh, uh, a theology, you know that Jesus kind of wandered around and roamed the earth for 40 more days, convincing people, hey, I'm here. This is really me. He goes to the disciples, right? This is me. Touch me. Put your hand on my side. He does all that. He does that whole thing. But just remember that Jesus is no longer present. The rest of Acts is, 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 is what Jesus passed on to us. So this word is important. Began means that there is something else that has to continue. And I would argue this is why Jesus, when he was alive in John 14, 12, he says these words, greater works than these shall you do. So so many people take issue with this word greater. See, it would be an arrogant statement if I said that and it wasn't in scripture. If I said, man, y'all saw what Jesus did? We're going to do greater. That's arrogant. That that, that, that wouldn't make any sense. That's, That's blasphemy. It would be crazy if Paul said it, but none of them say it. Them words are in red. They bright red. So Jesus is the one that says, the things that I did, greater works shall you do. And if you have an issue with greater, although Jesus actually did mean greater, if you have an issue with the word greater, let's replace greater with same. The same works I did. Is the church today doing the same works that Jesus did? Well, what did he do? He preached the gospel. He healed the blind. He raised the dead. Where's the power in the church? And I'm not angry. I'm just saying, I, I, when I read, when I was reading Acts, I was going, ooh, so much power. Ooh, boldness and ooh, proclamation. And ooh, people are getting set. Witches are getting saved and burning books. And I'm reading a book of Acts. And I'm going, oh, I can't wait to get to church. And I look around and I'm getting sad because I'm going, where's that power? Where's the power that we see in the book of Acts? Because the Bible says, here's what, what Luke says, oh, Theophilus, in this book, 
I'm talking about what Jesus began to do and teach, but now it's continued through, and not, through you and I. Let me also argue that this word began. Usually books have an ending, and the ending of a book usually is amen. I can prove this to you. I'm just going to go just to a few books that are, that are in the next books. Let's look at Romans. You don't got to go there. I'll read the last verse. This is the last verse in Romans. In the last verse in Romans, it says, verse 27, chapter 16, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Christ Jesus. Amen. That's the ending. That's fin- finality. Let me go. Let me go to 1 Corinthians. The last verse in 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, verse 24. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me just pick another one. Let me go to the book of, how about the book of Galatians? Let's go to Galatians 5, uh, Galatians 6. Verse 18, grace, the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ be with you in spirit, brothers. Here it is. Amen. The finality of a book is amen. But if you look at the last verse in the book of Acts, when I get to the last verse, he said in verse one, hey, here's what Jesus began. There has to be an ending, right? But look how the the last verse ends. It says, Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, period. There's no amen. You know why there's no amen? Because verse 1 of the book of Acts starts with what Jesus began. It's no ending. You and I are continuing what Jesus... Y'all hear me? You and I are continuing what Jesus has started in the book of Luke. Paul, um, uh, uh, Luke says, and it's being continued through the early church. And I would argue that it's being continued all the way to today. I just want you to just look at your neighbor just for a second and ask them, are we walking in the same power that we see in the book of Acts? Just ask them that. Are we walking in the same power? Because here's the thing. The book of Acts starts out with the miraculous, right? You get to chapter two, they speak it in tongues, the Holy Spirit's fallen. But do you realize that the last chapter, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save it for the end, But do you realize the last chapter, uh, uh, chapter 28, that miracles are still happening? It ain't like they stopped in Acts 2, but you get to the very last chapter and Paul does a healing revival on the island of Malta. Everybody that was sick got healed by Paul. And, And I just simply lift that to show you that miracles happen all the way through the book of Acts. You get to the last chapter and miracles are still happening. And then we get to the church today. And my question is, why in the world are we still walking around with infirmities when Acts 28 says, Paul said, you sick? Get you healed. Walk in healed. And man, that's my prayer. I was praying all day. Lord, if somebody got a bad diagnosis today, heal them, oh God. Somebody walking around with cancer, we ain't got to live like that. We are the children of God. Heal them, God. Because when I read, God, Acts gave me boldness. Gave me a new level of confidence. Had an elders meeting with Pastor Caleb today. We were talking. I, I just I couldn't help but like share it with him. Like, man, I just got so emboldened by simply just reading through the book of Acts. All right, I got to move quick because I said I'm going to do all 28 chapters. So peep this. Luke is the writer. Luke says, hey, listen, that first book I wrote, book of Luke, is what Jesus began to do and teach. This next book is what the church is doing and teaching through the being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus gives them a quick mission, before, and the mission is so important. I need, if you're going to take notes, write this verse down, because all of the book of Acts hinges upon verse 8 in chapter 1. All of the book. You will not understand. In fact, I would say, what we're doing in this room today hinges upon if what Jesus said in verse 8 is true. Here's what Jesus says. He says, but you will receive, talking to the disciples, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Somebody say Jerusalem. Come on, y'all talk in this room in Judea. Somebody say Judea and Samaria. Somebody say Samaria and the ends of the earth. Somebody say the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth is broad enough that we can at least agree that Brooklyn, New York is the ends of the earth. Like, we got we to gotta agree on this. And so Jesus, without naming Brooklyn, said, hey, what we doing here, what y'all about to receive, when y'all in that upper room, that thing's going to carry all the way through, through to 960 Atlantic Avenue. And when it hits 960 Atlantic Avenue, please hear me, Epiphany Church, I need them jokers in there to do what they saw in the book of Acts. 
I need, I need the same power working. But you right now, you in Jerusalem. All the disciples are in Jerusalem. The upper room was in Jerusalem. All the disciples are in Jerusalem. And he says this. He says, you're going to be my witnesses. Notice, Barry, he doesn't say you're going to be my lawyers. Because that's what we do. We just, want, we just want to parse Greek. We want to sit down with you. We want to argue the scriptures. And I ain't mad at it. There's a place for it. Peter says, always be ready to give a defense. So I ain't mad at it. But that's not what Jesus calls you. Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses. You're not the ones that sit and argue about the gospel. You're the ones that tell people how the gospel changed you because we're witnesses of the power of the, of the work of Christ. Let me tell you something. If we're in a courtroom right now, I don't care how convincing a lawyer is. A lawyer is never more convincing than the witness. I don't care how good the lawyer is. You pull up an eyewitness to the account and it changes everything. And when I read the book of Acts, I'm sitting there going, oh, they eyewitnesses. They eyewitnesses. And that's what we should be. We should be people that tell, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I need to tell somebody how good he is. It's Bible study. I'm getting excited in this Bible study. Chapter one, Jesus says, stay, stay here in Jerusalem, because while you're in Jerusalem, I'm going to drop something on y'all. That's going to give you so much power. This is also why I said when I was with y'all, this is why I say it's better that I go away. Jesus words, it's better that I go away because when I go away, I'm going to send the helper because it's what's, what's better than Jesus living with us, the Holy Spirit living in you, according to Jesus. I, it would be, if Jesus was here, I'd take this headset off, put it on him, and I'd sit down, and we would be so enamored by Jesus. But Jesus says, you know what's better than that? Is that God lives in you. And because he lives in you, the same works that I did, you now got the power to do. So they're in Jerusalem. Jesus says, stay there. Once the spirit hits you, I need y'all to go around. I need y'all to go to Judea. I need you to go to Samaria. I need you to get to the ends of the earth. I just want to read this real quick. I'm going to get out of chapter one because I want to get to chapter two. But I just want to read this real quick. It says in verse 9, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him away in their sight. And while there, uh, they were gazing into heaven and went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven this Jesus who was taking up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go to heaven. This is why I have so much confidence that Jesus is going to come back because Acts 1 told me that he went up on a cloud and the same way you saw him coming up is the same way that he's coming back. So if he really did go up, he's really going to come back. Now watch this. I need you to pay attention to the timeline. It was 40 days from Jesus' resurrection to his ascension. I told you he walked the earth for 40 days. The question is, how long did the disciples sit in the upper room and wait for the spirit of God? 10 days. Now, here's why that's important. Go to chapter two. We're in chapter two now, y'all. Why is that important? It's important because when the children of Israel had the Passover and they put the, the blood of the lamb on and, and God delivered them out of Egypt, in order for them to get the Ten Commandments, which was the covenant, which was the law, it was 50 days from the Passover. It is also in the New Testament 50 days from the Passover that they don't receive Ten Commandments, but they receive the new covenant, the Holy Spirit. Y'all are making me work, y'all. Chapter two, chapter two. This is how we're going to do it all. We're going to literally do the electric slide all the way through. Y'all don't do the electric slide anymore. Y'all don't know good dancing. <laughs> Chapter two. All right, so Jesus says, man, stay here, Jerusalem. Boom, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Then you're going to be my witnesses. Well, it actually happened. Verse one. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and they were uh, they were... And, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all, please don't miss this, all of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. I just need you to pay attention that all the disciples are in the upper room, 120 the Bible tells us, and they all get filled. Every 120 disciples get filled. Now, I just want, I want us to pay attention here that this is descriptive, not prescriptive. 
Because what happens is the churches that do a lot of tongues, what they'll do is they'll say, man, that should be operation today. But Paul corrects us later on when he corrects the church in, in, at, at Corinth in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So what I don't want us to do is read this and be like, that's what we need in the church. You know, it's descriptive of the early church birthing that the tongues fell and everybody started speaking in tongues. That doesn't mean our services should be filled with everybody speaking in tongues. I just need to correct that real quick. So watch this. Everybody's speaking in tongues. The Bible says, man, these men are drunk as ye suppose. I just want to read one person that's there because he's going to become important. Verse 14 says, then Peter standing with the 11. So Peter is with them. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. If you know the rest of uh, Acts chapter 2, he preaches a crazy sermon, preaches a sermon from Joel 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110. 3,000 souls get added to the church. Anybody know this story? We good? We all tracking along? So 3,000 souls get added to the church. They immediately become in, in community. Immediately. There's no needs. You, you can't, you're not eating? Sell your stuff. Let's give them some food. There was literally no needs among the body of Christ. That's my hope for the church. That's what the church should be. You got laid off? I got you. You ain't got nowhere to stay? I got a room. Like, this is what the church should be. And what happens is oftentimes we look for the organization of the, of the leaders to, to, to fix everything. But my question always is what small group you're in because your small group, gone, and we've seen it here, they're going to come around you and they're going to help you. That's what happens from verse 42 to verse 47. The Bible says that there was no needs in the church. So they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches. The church grows from 120 to 3,000 and 120. And the Bible says that they immediately get into community. Y'all rocking with me? Chapter 3. Chapter 3, we see that the Holy Spirit that was promised to them actually really got power, y'all. Can somebody do me a favor and just read for me? Can someone read? Let me get a reader first before I tell you what verses. Anybody? You got me, Sarah? Sarah, can you do me a favor? Just read loud as you, if you can. Um, read verse, so we're in chapter 3. Read verse 1 through verse 10. I just want you all to see this. Now, keep in mind, before she reads, I need you to pay attention. The Holy Spirit is now inside of the apostles, inside of the church, and I want you to see the power that the Holy Spirit gives us. I just need y'all to pay attention, right? The church is now, it's, it's moving. It's moving, and Peter is a, is a strong leader in the church. The Bible says that there's a man that's, that, that's lame. He's asking for, for, for alms. What I love about him, he, he actually teaches us what pastoring is, where he doesn't give the man what he wanted. He gave the man what he needed. And it's, it's honestly, it's part of good pastoring because there's a temptation to grow the crowd and you grow the crowd by giving everybody what they want. But good pastoring, Peter shows us, is I'm going to give you what you need. What you want is money, but I ain't got no money. Silver and gold have I not, but what I got I can give to you. And he gives them Jesus. Now, this is, this is, this is such an important, and that's accompanied with a miracle, with, with healing. I need you to pay attention really early that part of the normal rhythm of the church was the miraculous I want to prepare us because I believe that that's what God is moving 
Epiphany Church toward. I really do. We, we are, we are, I believe that God is moving us toward really seeing signs and wonder, wonders and, and not, and you know, sometimes I know how it is. It's like, man, well, they're they do, they doing too much. Do you realize that this was actually synonymous for them with evangelism? This was, see, because evangelism, and you're going to see that later on in Acts too. Evangelism for us, I'm not doing good on time. Evangelism for us often is let me just share my faith. Evangelism for the early church was let me share my faith, but also if you're sick, I got enough power to heal you because the Holy Spirit lives in me. Now, I need you to pay attention. What does the, what does the man do after he gets healed? The Bible says, uh, verse 8, leaping, he stood up and began to walk, and he entered the temple. I need you to see evangelism. He gets healed, and he goes to church. And see, this, this is what I'm saying. You've been begging that coworker to come to church. I wonder if you had a sick coworker, if you walk by them and the power of Jesus said you're healed and then they get healed, they'll run to church with you because that's exactly what the lame man did. The Bible says that he heals him and he immediately sends him to church. Now, I'm not building a whole theology of evangelism being uh, uh, accompanied with sharing your faith and faith and miraculous signs. I'm not I'm not building a whole theology on this one verse. It's through the whole book of Acts. Through the whole book of Acts, people get, people get healed and the, the miraculous happens and then boom, they become a part of the church. The rest of chapter three, I'm in chapter, I'm in chapter three, the rest of chapter three, after the, he gets healed, Solomon starts to preach. He grabs, uh, it's called Solomon's portico or Sol- Solomon's porch. He starts to preach and in the, in the beginning of his preaching, he has to convince them, hey, what's because they were all like, man, this was amazing. It's amazing that you got that type of power. He said, whoa, 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 be careful here. The power that you see ain't because of me. It's because I raised him in the name. And, it, you know, Peter has boldness here because he's like, I raised them in the name of the one that y'all killed. That's what Peter does. And so he preaches in, in Solomon's portico. That's chapter three. I'm moving along. We're now in chapter chapter four. Chapter four, the temple of, uh, officials don't like that these uneducated fishermen are teaching uh, a, a doctrine that contradicts theirs. And so the Bible says that they arrest them. Now, one of the things you're going to see often throughout the book of Acts is, man, they get arrested quite often. And so he, here's the first time we see that they are being arrested. But you know what I really want you to pay attention to? In, 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 um, is verse 8 in chapter 4. Because remember when I read in Acts 2 that they were all filled, and I wanted to make sure I pointed out that Peter was part of all? In verse 8, it says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So wait a second. Peter was already filled. Why is he filled again? And I can prove it to you by the end of chapter 4, he gets filled a third time. Why, you, why do you keep filling him? Because when it comes to the Holy Spirit, and there's a whole... There's, I, we have a Bible study on this, so I ain't gonna, you, you can find it online. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the moment you profess faith in Jesus Christ, you are empowered with the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of you. The moment, you ain't got to wait two weeks for a tarry and serve. The moment you trust Jesus, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But when you go through life, in order to do ministry and do life, you have to constantly be filled. Do you know this morning when I got up, when I started reading the book of Acts, the first thing I said is, God, fill me up because I'm about to go talk to people. I need your spirit to fill me up. And so every time when you wake up, that should be your prayer. Fill me with your spirit today. I don't know what demon I'm going to run across. I'm gonna know, I don't know what sickness I'm going to run across. Fill me with your spirit. That's how the church operated in the book of Acts. And I would argue that this filling of the Holy Spirit gave Peter a different level of boldness. It gave him a different level of boldness. Watch this. Verse 8, it said that Peter was filled again, and he said to them, so he's filled. Now, now he got the Spirit of God living, uh, uh, using him right now. Watch how bold he is. Rulers and the people and the elders, he starts talking to them. He says, if we are being examined today concerning the deeds done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, y'all see this boldness, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, 
by him, this man is standing before you all. He's like, look, I know y'all are just all in awe of the fact that this man just got raised up, but he got raised up by the one y'all put on the cross. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected and the builders, uh, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which man shall be saved. Watch the words here, verse 13. Now, when they saw the, the boldness, in fact, by the end of this chapter, they are praying again for boldness. Now, y'all got to remember that this is Peter. And yeah, Peter might have been nice with them hands, but don't forget, there was often times where Peter was filled with fear. What about when Peter walked on the water? Fearful. What about when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was failing Jesus at that time. What about when he denied Jesus three times? That's the same Peter. How in the world does Peter somehow get this miraculous boldness? Oh, because in Acts chapter 2, he's filled with the Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, he's filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of God gives us boldness. You ever walked in a conversation and you talking about Jesus? And you're like, oh, man, I'm nervous. I don't know how this is going to go. But the Spirit of God gives you a presence and a boldness. I need us to walk in that, y'all. I ain't saying being arrogant, but there should be a boldness in you. Acts chapter 2, he's like, man, y'all killed Jesus. Acts chapter 3, he's like, y'all killed Jesus. Acts chapter 4, he's like, y'all killed Jesus, and he just raised him up. There is a boldness that, 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 that Peter has that, man, when you share your faith, I'm asking my prayers that you, would pray, that you would share your faith in boldness. When we open up this mic for prayer, and people are worried, like, I don't know if I should pray. The devil is a liar, boldness. You need to be bold. Boldness to operate in that calling. Some of you are timid to step out and do what God has called you to do and told you to do. And it's fear that is gripping you. But I am praying today that the spirit of fear would hold you no longer, that you would walk in the boldness that Peter walked in, even though he was a fearful man. I'm going to move on for the sake of time. So Acts 4 verse 31, the Bible says that they start praying for boldness and they start walking in a different level of boldness. Acts chapter 5. Oh, I wanted to show you that he was filled again. In, in uh, verse 31, when they had prayed and the place that they were gathered together was shaken, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And watch how it's connected to boldness and can do you speak the word of God with boldness, with boldness. Acts chapter 5. We doing all right, y'all? Acts chapter 5. Now, I promise you it's going to take a little longer as I'm going through the first few chapters. Once we get to the end, it starts to, we're going to couple some things together. It's going to move a little quicker. Uh, chapter 5, there's a story with a guy, uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, did anybody heard that story before? Where they, they, they take a piece of the, 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 um, the, the money and they hide it up under their tent. And the Bible literally says that they drop dead. Now, I need us to pay attention. The issue with Ananias and Sapphira was not that they didn't give everything to God. The issue was that they said they gave everything to God when they didn't. So the issue isn't the fact that they didn't empty their bank account. The issue was that they told God they did. Lying is at the core. Character is at the core. And let's take money off the table. When I was thinking about this and praying about this earlier, I realized that many of us are Ananias and Sapphira, but it's not money. It's not money that we're talking about tonight. I think it's our lives where we tell God, I'm sold out for you. I'm giving you everything, but you hold back a piece of who you are and you don't give God everything. And when that is the case, you, I'm not saying you're going to drop dead, but I am saying God frowns upon the fact that we say we're giving everything and we don't. Now, I ain't beating you up, but I am saying that this year, God wants full access to your life. It's not a part of your life that he doesn't want. He wants the good. He wants the bad. He wants the ugly. He wants the things you're ashamed of because he's the only one that can restore them. And here it is. Help you to walk in that boldness. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they die because they, they lied. The Bible says they don't just lie to man, although they were talking to the apostles, but they lied to God. They lied to the Holy Spirit. I want to point out just quickly in Acts chapter 5, I want to point out verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. The only reason I wanted to lift up this verse, and we're kind of moving here. The only reason I wanted to lift up this verse is because I want you to see how the early church operated. Verse 42 in chapter 5 said that they met together 
in the temple and in the house. When I was going through seminary, there, there was a group of guys that were, were starting um, these house churches. I went to, to Philadelphia Biblical University. When I graduated, it was called Karen University. And there was a group of guys, man, that were, um, that were starting these, like they were called them like house churches, and they were like, you know, just, get, you know, they, and like everything that you, and I'm not against it, but everything that you see a church does in the New Testament, they were doing in, small, in smaller homes. And it was like it was working. Praise God. My problem was that they had an issue with churches that were not meeting in homes, but were actually meeting in buildings. And they were they were condemning them. And I'm going, man, when I read this, I'm like, oh, but the early church met in the temple and they met in homes, which is why we gather ourselves together tonight. We gather ourselves on Sunday morning, but we also getting in each other's lives and we doing small group together and we we meeting for coffee and we doing the thing because that's what the early church did. What the early church did was they met together in the temple. I'm going to show you that again later. And they also met together in the homes. That's the only reason I wanted to lift that. Chapter six and chapter seven, I'm going to do together. Chapter six, we know this one. Verse number uh, two says, when the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples, they said to them, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good, rep- of, of good repute, full of the spirit of wisdom, whom we will point to this duty. The duty they're talking about is the duty of, of being a deacon. The reason we have deacons is because the early church had deacons. The reason the early church had deacons is because the disciples were doing everything. The leaders, the elders were doing everything. And they were like, we ain't got time for prayer, study the word and preach the word. And so let's raise up people to share the load. The reason we have deacons here at Epiphany Church is to help share the load of ministry. And so the deacons are, they're finally put in place into the church. Now, I want to lift up really one deacon to you because Chapter 7 flows into this guy named Stephen. Now, what, what, I, what, I like, what I like about Stephen is Stephen was, Stephen had a unique gift. He wasn't just a disciple, but he had the gift of teaching. In fact, verse number 10 says, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit in which he, meaning Stephen, was speaking. And so what they did was they said, you know, how you, you ever get to argue with somebody and you run out of like argument points? And then you just start making insults. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That, that's what they did. But instead of making insults, they're like, oh, we ain't got nothing else to say to Stephen. Let's kill him. And so what Stephen becomes is the first martyr of the church. Millions have been martyred for their faith since Stephen. But Steve, we're going to see later on that James is martyred for his faith. But in this passage, Stephen is the, you wait, he just got appointed as a deacon. And he's already being, um, being um, martyred for his faith. Now, I just want to point out verse 15, because in ancient times, they, you know, when Moses was spending time with the Lord, and the Bible says that he had to put a veil over his face. Y'all remember, sir, because his face was glowing, it was shining. So ancient Israel always associated uh, like a glow with you being with the Lord. I want to point out verse number 15. This is what the Bible says about Stephen. And gazing at him, all who set in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. They would have immediately recognized that he had been with the Lord, but that wasn't enough. They still killed him. So all of you who, you know, got that nice glow and that oil and that shine, it means you've been spending time with the Lord. You don't just have good dewy products at home. Spend the time with the Lord. All right. So we have no time for jokes tonight. We roll into chapter seven. We're now in chapter seven. Chapter seven, um, Stephen is making his case. Stephen, Stephen is, is preaching. He's telling them about Jesus. He's bold too, y'all. He's bold. He know he about to die. He know he about to be stoned, but he's, he's still bold. Stephen, uh, um, when, he, when he's about to die, there's such a parallel between Stephen's words and Jesus' words when Jesus died. Jesus says, Father, I commit my spirit to you. I'm at the end of chapter seven. Stephen says, Lord, receive my spirit. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Stephen says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then boom, Stephen, Stephen uh, is killed. Now, I need us to pay attention to chapter 8. Chapter 8, the Bible says in verse number 1, and Saul, now we're going to know him. This is the first time we get mentioned to who we know as the one who wrote 75% of the New Testament. But before he wrote 75% of the New Testament, Saul approved of Stephen's execution. So 
So Saul in this moment is a terrorist. Saul in this moment is a hater of the church. He's a hater of Jesus. He, he has, not only is he a hater, but he's dragging the Christians out of their homes and he's killing them and, and he's approving of, of their death. So verse one, the Bible introduces us to this, guy named, to this guy named Saul. But I need us to pay attention to what happens because of persecution in the church. It says, Saul approved of his execution and there arose that day a great persecution. I'm in verse one of chapter eight. Uh, persecution against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the region. Now, I need you to pay attention. That persecution caused them to scatter where Jesus originally told them in Acts 1 verse 8 to go. Where did Jesus tell them to go? Judea. Well, that's where they were scattered. Where else were they scattered? Samaria. And the Bible says, except the apostles. So Jesus used persecution in Jerusalem to get them out of Jerusalem. Now, I need you to pay attention here because Jesus told them in Acts 1 verse 8, you're going to be my witnesses, but you're going to start here in Jerusalem. Stay here. Holy Spirit's going to come. Then I need you to get out. Watch this. The first eight chapters, they stayed in Jerusalem. And Jesus is like, wait, I, I know I told you all to get out of Jerusalem, but y'all stay here. So I'm going to send a little persecution, which by the way, please notice, I know we like this cookie cutter, beautiful, you know, this, this utopia type of Christianity. But God often does not use peace and prosperity to move mission. God often uses hardship and persecution. I don't like it. I wish he didn't do it. But that's what God often uses. And so what he uses in chapter 8, the Bible says that they're all in Jerusalem. He said, but I told them to go to Judea. I told them to go to Samaria. I told them that they need to take these things to the end of the earth. How in the world is Brooklyn going to hear about the gospel if they stay in Jerusalem? I need to get them out. Stephen is stoned, and I'm going to send persecution to the church. The Bible says that they scatter. But do you know what they do when they scatter? Verse number four. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Here, here's another deacon. And Philip went down to Samaria, which is where he was told to go. He went down to Samaria proclaiming them the Christ. And the crowds all paid attention with one accord to what was being said. And Philip, uh, when they heard, and they heard him and they saw the signs that he did, the unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice, came out of many, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. I just need us to pay attention for a second. We are introduced now to one of the deacons that has a very dominant gift, and the gift is of evangelism. In fact, Peter is the only one in all of the book of Acts that has a title next to his name. When, not here in, 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 in Acts chapter 8, but when you go later on, we're going to see that Philip is called Philip. This is what the Bible calls him, the evangelist. Now, once again, how I was taught growing up was that evangelism was sharing your faith. But there's three things that Paul did in Samaria. Please note, he's an evangelist. So this is evangelism. There's three things that Paul did. The Bible says he preached, he cast out demons, and he healed the sick. I keep trying to tell y'all that synonymous with the church growing is not just sharing your faith. It's walking in a different level of boldness where you have power with God that you can actually heal the sick. That's what, and watch this, and that's called evangelism. I, I need us to redefine what we think of when we think evangelism. Because when we think evangelism, it's like, man, I just got to get my points out. Philip is like, no, I got to. I got to tell that person to get up. They're sick. And that's evangelism. It's accompanied with the, is this making sense to anybody? It's accompanied with the miraculous. So people are being saved left and right, right? In Samaria, not in Jerusalem, but in Samaria. But people are being saved so much that Jerusalem hears about it. And so the Bible says that Jerusalem, the leaders in Jerusalem is like, Peter and John, get down to Samaria, find out what's going on. I'm still in Acts chapter 8. Later on in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says that Peter and John come to Samaria, but while they're coming to Samaria, the Holy Spirit tells Philip, I got another assignment for you. He tells them to leave Samaria, which by the way, where ministry is going well, to go to the desert for one person. If this ain't what Jesus said when Jesus said in Luke 15, I'll leave the 99 to go after the one. He's like, man, there's a, there's a black man, there's an Ethiopian that's riding a chariot. And I, got, I, got, I need him 
to be a part of my team. So Philip, leave where ministry is going well, go into the desert. You'll find the Ethiopian eunuch there. I need you to get up in his chariot. He's reading Isaiah 53, verse uh, 7 and 8. And the Bible says that Philip is able to explain the gospel to him. They're riding by water. He says, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? I want you to notice the progression. We're going to see it later on. He's saved and he's baptized. And then the Bible says that, uh, uh, that, 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 that Philip leaves. I'm going to move quick. Chapter 9. Is this all right, y'all? Okay. I'm, oh, man, I'm taking a long. Chapter 9. That guy Saul that approved of the execution of Stephen, he's now persecuting Christians, and Christians are running now. And part of where they run is on this road called Damascus. And the Bible says that Saul chases after them. And after he chases after them, Jesus blinds him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'm in chapter nine. Why are you persecuting me? Here's what's so interesting, that Paul was actually persecuting the body. He never met Jesus, but Jesus saw the persecution of the body and said, that's so closely connected to me. You're you're persecuting me. And the Bible says that in that moment that he not only saves him, but he gives him his assignment that he knows that he's going to suffer many things, but he's going to he's going to build the kingdom of God. I put my cards on the table. Paul is my favorite outside of Jesus because he's so real. And he 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 lets us know that God knows how to use the furthest person on your mind that you think God will use. If he made a terrorist, an apostle. Don't tell me he can't save that uncle of yours. Don't tell me he can't save that friend of yours. And so I I want us to be prepared because I do think the next season of our church is going to be filled with people who don't necessarily know church lingo. Is that anybody's prayer? Who don't necessarily know protocol, but they know who to call. Like that's, that's my prayer is that God would, and I don't want us to be all uptight and, and weird and oh, who are they? The devil's a liar. Paul is the who are they, but he is not only saved, but he becomes the major leader in the New Testament. All right, I'm going to move on. So Paul is now saved. Um, he's saved. He's not immediately doing ministry. But chapter 10 and chapter 11, that's where we are. Chapter 10, chapter 11. Let's do those together. I'm going to make them real quick. Um, Peter is, um, he's, he's, he's preparing now to preach to the Gentiles and, 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 and talk to the Gentiles. The Bible says, uh, verses 10 through 23, I don't have time to read them, that, that he falls into a trance. It's not a vision. It's not, it's not a dream. But the Bible says that he falls into a trance. And as he falls into a trance, the Bible says that he sees all of this, this meat, all of this meat coming down. And, and, and then when he wakes up, God tells him, Rise, kill, and eat. Now, Peter has a very strict, very strict Jewish uh, 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 dietary restrictions. They do not eat anything that is unclean. And Peter says that to him. No, God, I'll never eat that. There's no way I'll eat that. And he's like, don't. He said, I'll never eat it because it's unclean. He says, don't call it unclean. Now, just real quick for you vegetarians. Y'all hear me? I just want to be clear here. I think you might have a case in terms of health, right? You might... Bacon probably ain't good to eat all the time. I'm with you, but don't make it a biblical mandate because what God just said was bacon was not only good and it is good. He said it was clean. Okay, y'all don't got to eat it. Ah, it's what Jesus said. Okay, so watch this. For him, that meant you need to go because the Gentiles are now about to be saved. And so because up to this point, you see Jewish leaders getting saved. Uh, Jewish people getting saved, but here we go with, um, he goes to Cornelius' house. I'm still in Acts chapter 10. He goes to Cornelius' house, and he starts to preach, and people are getting saved. The Bible says, verse 44 of chapter 10, while Peter was standing, was still saying these things, so he preached a sermon, the Holy Spirit fell on all who, uh, who heard that he's at Cornelius' house. These are not Jewish believers. These are Gentiles, and the believers... From among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. And Peter declared, can anyone withhold water 
for, bapti- for baptizing them. This is so funny to me because, you know, Pete, Peter is just trying to figure this out. Up until this point, all he knows is that they baptized Jewish people. That's all he knows. But now he sees Cornelius and his whole household get saved. He's like, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this, but let's baptize them. Again, notice the progression. They get saved, then they get baptized. Because what happens is a lot of times people will say, well, baptism is a, re- is a requirement for salvation. In order for you to be saved, you have to be baptized. But they were already saved, which is why he baptized them. Unless you can tell me that they got the Holy Spirit poured out on them and they weren't believers. That's What kind of doctrine is that? No, they were believers and then he baptized them. I don't want to get stuck on this point. But I do want to say, if anybody in this room has not been baptized, it is a nat- I need you to notice that the Ethiopian eunuch got saved and got baptized. Cornelius' house got saved and got baptized. And I think that there's, I really do, I believe that there's a group of people that have professed faith that are even in this local body and maybe, maybe beyond in terms of Sunday morning, but you've never been baptized. You should be baptized. As we talk about the book of Acts and walking in power, one of the things that was a dominant theme of the book of Acts was baptism. In fact, you know what I want to do? I don't know if leaders are listening to me. I don't know if Gabe and Nate are here, but here's what I want to do. Our next Bible study next month, I actually want to do baptisms. And I want to do it for every single person that is in the church that has not been baptized, that has professed faith in Jesus. Every person. And I know we normally do them on a Sunday morning, but let's set the pool up. Let's put the water in the pool. In fact, Nate, I don't know if you hear, Nate is teaching our next Bible study. Nate, I, he probably got a topic. Change the topic. <laughs> now you're teaching on baptism. <laughs> Nate, you got 30 minutes on baptism and we're going to be, and I'm getting in the water. And anybody that want to be baptized, we need to baptize. Because that's what's happening in the book of Acts, y'all. So Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' house all gets saved. Acts chapter 11, Peter goes back to Jerusalem because he has to report back to Jerusalem what, what happened. That Gentiles just got saved. We got new brothers and sisters. That, that is so foreign for them. They hated Gentiles. That is foreign for them. So the Bible says that Peter goes back, Acts chapter 11, he goes back to Jerusalem. Because you remember, they don't have social media. They don't have a live stream. Their live stream act like our live stream tonight. It just don't work. It just didn't work. And so they had to go back. He had to go or take the travel from where he was at Cornelius' house and go back to Jerusalem to tell them what had happened. All right. Chapter 12. All right. Chapter 12. James is killed. He becomes the second martyr. James is killed for his faith. Um, Peter gets locked up, which is very common. But while Peter gets locked up, I have a sermon on this, so I'm not going to preach it long tonight. But Peter gets locked up. But while he's locked up, uh, Mary, the mother of John, has a prayer service in her house. And while she has a, has a prayer service in her house, Peter uh, gets released in a miraculous way. I need you to read it on your time. In a miraculous way, in chapter 12, uh, Peter gets saved out of prison. He walks out of prison. He shows up at the prayer service. He knocks on the door, and they are so fearful. They don't even know how much power they got in their prayers that they're praying for Peter to be saved. Peter gets out of jail, and they're like, it's a ghost at the door. That can't be Peter. So they prayed even with doubt, but even in their doubtful prayers had power. And I want you to understand the importance of prayer as well. I wonder if Peter didn't pray, if the if the house of of Mary didn't pray, I wonder if Peter would have died. Your prayer has the ability to save lives because they prayed. Peter got sent out of jail in a miraculous way, and it was happening while they were praying. Like like God almost answered it real time. I also wonder if they prayed for James, if James would have lived. I don't know. It's hyperbole. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's really clear to me that the power that of prayer in the house of Mary, John's mother, it's clear to me that those prayers is what brought Peter outside. So he gets to the house. They're like, I don't know if it's Peter. I don't know if it's Peter. The girl slams the door. I don't know if it's Peter. Finally, they're like, it's Peter. They let him in. Chapter 13 and chapter 14. Now, remember that Paul that got saved? Y'all remember him? Notice he hasn't done anything yet. Chapter 3, chapter 13, we get to see the movement of Peter. But before we do, I just want to read this. There's a prayer, another prayer service that is happening in chapter 13. Now, when the church 
at Antioch. So the gospel has now reached Antioch, y'all. Started in Jerusalem, it's in Antioch. Prophets and teachers in Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. That's the one who killed John the Baptist, by the way. And Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Paul for the work in which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, meaning Barnabas and Paul, and sent them out. I just need you to notice just real quick. I'm going to do a drive by. Notice the leaders that are in the church are extremely diverse. Barnabas, he's a Levite from Cyprus, according to Acts chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, uh, Simeon called Niger. Niger means black, presumably a black African. In fact, many people think that this is the same Simeon that carried the cross for Jesus. Simeon was from Cyrene, which is current day Libya. Lucius of, he is from Cyrene. Lucius from Cyrene, not empire or power, whatever one it is. Lucius from Cyrene. Cyrene was a city uh, right off the Mediterranean Sea. It is current day Libya. And then Menaean is a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. That's the one who killed John the Baptist. Clearly Menaean and Herod the Tetrarch had two different paths of life. One killed John the Baptist. The other one became a, a leader in the early church. And then there's Paul, Saul, a.k.a. Paul. Now notice that Paul has done no ministry And you know why he hasn't done any ministry yet? Because he first needed to be affirmed by the church before he did it. This is so important. I don't got a lot of time to deal with it, but I can tell you now. What I love about Peter is he's saved in Acts chapter 9. He does nothing. Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter uh, 12, uh, 11, 12. He only does ministry after Acts chapter 13. Why? Because the church at Antioch laid their hands, affirmed him, commissioned him, and sent him off. And this is why it's important to be a part of the church. You cannot just be a part of the church to get the baby dedicated and have weddings and funerals. We do that, but that is not the totality of the church. The church should be affirming who you are and sending you off. You get 75% of the New Testament because the church of Antioch knew what they were doing. Paul and Barnabas now set out on mission. They go from city to city. Acts chapter 14, they go to Iconium, Lystria. Um, the Bible says in Acts 14, 21, that many, many disciples were made. So Yolanda is on her job. Disciples are being made in Acts 14. Acts chapter 23, they appointed elders. So now leadership is starting to be uh, set up in the church at Antioch and in Lystra and Iconium. Do y'all notice how the gospel is spreading? We started in Jerusalem, y'all, but now the gospel is spreading quick here. Acts chapter 15, I'll make this quick because Cornelius got saved and his household, you know that more Gentiles got saved. Here's the problem. When they got saved, God did not tell Peter, hey, start a church for the Jews over there and across town start a church for the Gentiles. He said, no, y'all actually do life together. Now, here's why that's a problem. Remember when Peter was like, I'll never eat that? Most of the Jews were like, I would never eat that. But let me tell you, the small groups at the Gentile house was ribs, was chicken, was pork. Like they ate everything. And so the Jews and the Gentiles started to bump heads. And so the Jews were like, this is what needs to happen. If Gentiles are getting saved, they need to be circumcised. They need to be circumcised. So they had to argue over dietary restrictions. They're arguing over circumcision. And Peter and, and the rest of the, the leaders are all uh, arguing it. And finally, I'm just going to read this one verse. Verse 28 says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit not to lay on you any greater burden. So circumcision is now not a requirement for um, to be a part of the church. It was a requirement and under Jewish law. It is no longer a requirement. Um, Trying to think where I want to go from here for the sake of time. All right. So now they're, they, they're about to break off again. They're, they're planning another. Mi- Am I all right? Everybody good? We're now about to break off to another mission trip with Paul and Barnabas. But Paul and Barnabas get into an argument. And I mean, it's an argument. The argument over is whether to take John Mark. Because clearly Barnabas is like, that's my boy. I like him. But Paul is like, he's useless. I don't want him to be around. And so Paul is like, don't bring them. Barnabas is like, bring them. Don't bring them. Bring them. And the, the, the dissension and the arguments got so bad that they broke two separate ways. And the Bible says that Barnabas and John Mark go one way. And Paul, he then takes Silas and they go another way. Now, here's why that's important, because in the Christian church and you y'all know how we are, we like, I got to be friends with everybody. We all got to be friends. But do you know that there's just some people that you just won't get along with, even though you're brothers and sisters in Christ? Here it is. And it's OK. 
As long as you ain't slandering them, as long as you ain't gossiping with them, everybody don't have to eat over your house. Paul and Barnabas split and it was over John Mark. But here's how mature Paul is. That when he writes the letter to Colossians and he's ending his final greetings, you know who he says greet? John Mark. Because Paul, even though they had an issue in chapter 15, he still was mature enough to realize that this was still his brother. I'm going to move on. We're now in chapter 16. Paul and Silas uh, end up in Troas um, where they have a vision to to, to go to Macedonia. This is chapter, this is verse number 10. Y'all with me in chapter 16? Uh, where, where they are, they're getting what's called the Macedonian call. Immediately, they set, set sail from Macedonia, head to the district of Mace, uh, Macedonia. Again, the gospel is just spreading. Um, verse 25, I just want to read this real quick. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. So they, they get, hold on, where are we at? Yeah, chapter 16. So they get, they get arrested. The Bible says about at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prison and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were open. Anybody ever heard the story before? And everyone's uh, bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke up, he saw the prison doors were open. He drew a sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But. Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer, I'm going to just paraphrase it. The jailer ends up getting saved and his household. Here's what makes Paul such a problem. Here's what makes him a threat to the very kingdom of hell. That if you leave him and let him be, the whole city going to get saved. You put him in jail, the jail going to get saved. This is the type of witness I want to have. I want demons in every city I go to to be like, oh, God, why is he here? That's what I want for you. That's, that's walking in this, in this power. We're going to move to chapter, seven, chapter 17. So the Philippine jailer and his whole household get saved. Chapter 17, um, Paul is preaching. And I don't know why I thought I could do this all in one night, y'all. Uh, <laughs> the, the, let me ask y'all this. Can y'all give me to 915? I never ask y'all for 915. Are we good for 915? I promise I'll be done by 915. And it's going to go quicker after we get to chapter 20. Uh, chapter 17, Paul is preaching in Thessalonica. He, he ends up, we're in chapter 17, he ends up in Athens. Uh, this is where Pastor Craig preached a couple of weeks ago. So you should, I'm not going to preach it because you can go check out the sermon. But Pastor Craig was preaching about being on mission and, and, and he used uh, Thessalonica. Now here's what I love about the city that Paul finds himself in. Again, the gospel is spreading. Paul sees an unknown statue. And he uses what we call cultural relevant ministry because he, he doesn't like randomly just walk in and then just say, let me just preach. He, he observes, he, he, he exegetes not just the text, he exegetes the city. And he looks around and he goes, oh, there's an unknown statue because it was very religious. That's the night it was very religious. So he looks at a statue, he says, that statue right there, let me tell you about that statue. And he begins from there to launch a platform of the gospel. Now, what I love about his gospel presentation is that he quotes their own poets. Do you know in your scriptures, it says in verse 28, I'm in Acts 17, it says, for in him we live and move and have our being. He goes on to say, as even some of your own poets have said, this is their rappers. This is, this is, this is, this is their drakes and their soldier boys and their, their little wains. He quotes them in his sermon. And the reason he does that is because he knows that that's going to connect with them. So, Chapter 17, he's preaching in Thessalonica. Chapter 18, Paul is, is, is in Corinth. Gospel is spreading. Again, he's in another city. Uh, just, need, just so you know, Corinth is, you know them because of the book of Corinthians. What you may not know about Corinth is it was what we would call here an extremely liberal city. A lot of sexual activity. It was Miami on steroids. It, it was Las Vegas on steroids, a lot of bar, uh, barbarianism. Uh, in fact, Paul, when he, it, it creeps into the church because when Paul corrects them in 1 Corinthians 6, he lists out a bunch of sins and a lot of them are sexual. This is the church where he was like, man, you're, you, one of y'all, you got your father's wife. That's what, Paul, that's what Paul says to them. So it is an extremely crazy city, but this is where the gospel needed to go. So he finds himself there. Acts chapter 19, 
Paul is in Ephesus. He's teaching, uh, the, it, it, he's teaching really in two places. He's teaching in, in, in the synagogue. He's also teaching in something called the Hall of Tyrannus, which was Greek territory. It was, it was non-believer territory. And what I love about the Hall of Tyrannus is it is very similar to the building that we're in now in terms of the usage of it. Because the Hall of Tyrannus, if you know anything about it, it was a lecture hall, but it was for lectures for, a secular, uh, for secular people. But what Paul did was for two years, he rented it out. He rented it out for, he got a lease for two years. And they shared the gospel where secular poets and philosophers would go and give lectures. And Paul said, listen, and this is why, this is why we're here. This is why we have this building. We wanted to redeem a club. We wanted, I'm serious. We wanted to redeem a restaurant and a place where you was popping bottles and twerking. We wanted to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our hall of tyrannies. I got a friend in, in Colorado that their church just outgrew the space that they were in. They literally now have a Budweiser building. That's their hall of tyrannies. And so Peter is sharing the gospel. The Bible says he's there for two years. A crazy failed exorcism happens with the sons of Sceva. You read this stuff. What I do love about Acts 19 is the birthing of the church of Ephesus. Do you know that the birthing of the church of Ephesus started with ex-witches? Because if you keep reading in Acts chapter 19, the Bible says that people bring their sorcery books and their seance books and they bring them in the middle of the city and they burn them because they're giving their life to the Lord. I'm preaching about this on Sunday. In fact, I have a sermon titled Witches and Warlocks on Sunday. Because I realize that our church is, as our church is growing in, in, in spiritual gifts, I also realize that there are going to be a lot of prophets and witches and warlocks that will try to destroy the very voice of God. So I'm preaching about on that Sunday. I'm not going to preach on it now. That's who's getting saved in the church in Acts chapter 19. Ministry is booming. I mean, people getting healed, not because Paul laying hands on them, but because his handkerchief touched them. That's power. Okay, I'm going to move on. So witches are being converted. Um, the, the, the city of, of Ephesus is, is now being saved. Acts chapter 20, Paul ends up um, bouncing around from Macedonia to uh, Syria to Troas. I preached Acts 20 a few weeks ago. If you remember in Troas, he was preaching. He preached so long, kind of like what I'm doing tonight. He preached so long that the boy fell out the window. Y'all remember that sermon? So I'm not going to preach it again. He, that's Acts chapter 20. The boy falls out the window. He, he heals him. He goes back upstairs and preaches till the sun comes up. It's my kind of guy. That's why I like Paul. All right, 21 and 22, I'm going to do these real quick. I'm going to do them together. Paul is about to head to Jerusalem. They beg him not to go. I mean, beg him. They actually prophesied to him that when you go to Jerusalem, that you, you, you'll die there. Now, here's the thing. Paul, he knew that Jerusalem was next for him. He knew that. And so they're begging him, and they're begging him, and they're begging him. Prof, Prophet Agabus tells him, don't go. He tucks the bell. Whoever has this bell ties him up. You're not going to make it out and he, 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 goes, he goes anyway to Jerusalem, but he realized that this is the last time he's going to see them, so it's all crying. Read the rest of the chapter. They're crying. Um, what I do want to point out, I do want to point this out, y'all. In Acts chapter 21, he is, when he finally gets to Jerusalem, the Bible says, is at, yeah, Acts 21, that he's arguing his ethnicity, and he's arguing his citizenship. He's like, I'm Jewish. He's like, I'm a Roman citizen. But do you realize in Acts chapter 21 that Paul gets mistaken to be an Egyptian? Now, here's why that's important. Here's why this is important. God, help me, Lord. It's important because clearly Paul had some melanin in that skin. Because Egypt, Egyptians can say they're not African. But if you look geographically where Egypt is, it is North Africa. It's Northeast Africa. How do you mistake? How do you mistake someone who has no melanin? Now, this, now I just want to be clear. This, he not, they're not, this ain't no Alex Rodriguez Regez tan. That's not what this is. Like, this is his melanin. This is his skin tone. And they mistake. Now, I have to say this is because I know how it is, man. There are some people that really, they really do struggle with the faith because they're like, I don't see myself in here. I'm not saying Paul is a black man, but I am saying I went to Israel and I saw Jews that was darker than me. I sat with Ethiopian Jews that traced their heritage all the way back to Dan. I sat with them. I was like, you a Jew? 
You know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the Jews on, 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 on flat, in Flatbush on you know, <laughs> Eastern Parkway. I'm like, bro, where your things at? You ain't no Jew. But let me tell you something. It does, it, oh, man, I don't want to get in trouble, y'all. It just makes me question who's occupying Israel right now. I'm getting political. Should I stop, babe? Paul was mistaken for an Egyptian. You got to do something with that. You got to do something with that. I'm going to just read it because y'all think I'm making it up. It says, verse 37, and Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, meaning into, because you know he got, he went to jail again. And he said to the tribu- tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Here's their response to them. Are you not an Egyptian then? How do you mistake? I'm going to move on. Chapter 23. Move on, y'all. Chapter 23. That just did something to my soul, though. Chapter 23. A group of men, Paul is doing ministry so well that a group of men make an oath that they will not eat again until Paul dies. Do you know how much you have to hate Paul to make an oath never to eat or drink again until he, he, they're basically saying, if he don't die, we going to die. And so they make oath. clearly they died because Paul didn't die, at least not here in chapter 23. He does die a little bit later. He don't die here. So chapter 23 they make this oath and they're like, it's 40 people, by the way, 40 men say, man, if he, do, if he don't, we gotta, he got to die. Chapter 24 to, through 26, I'll do these, I'll couple these together. We, only got, I'm, we almost done. Chapter 24 to 26, you read that on your own time. He's basically bouncing around from court to court. He's at the court of Felix and Festus. He's at Agrippa. He's before uh, Bernice. I love, you know, all these places that he goes, he's sharing the gospel to the point where Agrippa was like, are you trying to persuade me to be a Christian? So Paul, everywhere he goes, it doesn't matter where he is, jail, living, court, everybody getting saved because he's around them. All right, chapter 27. Man, we almost done, y'all. Chapter 27. I was nervous. Chapter 27, Paul set sail to go to Rome. Now, I need you to pay attention. We started where? In Jerusalem. We are now at the largest city. Almost. We're not there yet. We're almost at the largest city known to man in ancient times which is the place of Rome. So the Bible says that Paul set sail. They're setting sail to Rome, but they get detoured because a hurricane hits. The hurricane is so bad that it rips the ship apart. But an angel speaks to Paul and says, look, there's 276 people on this ship, but here's what's going to happen. Every single one of them will live if you do two things. Number one, cut the ropes that have the, that, that have the, the, um, the, the extra float, the, the extra uh, ships, the extra boats. Cut the ropes. Let them float off. Stay on the ship as long as you can. And when it breaks apart, float on the planks. That's what the angel told him. Paul tells everybody what to do. Cut the ropes. They cut the ropes. They, they, they float off. They stay on the ship as long as they can. And the Bible says that some of them swim to the shore of Malta, of, of the island of Malta, and some of them float on planks. And all the Bible says that all 276 live because they listen to Paul. Because Paul listened to the angel. They get to the island of Malta. The, 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 um, the natives there are very nice. So they make a fire. Because of the warmth of the fire, a snake comes up, bites Paul. Now, now just me, if I'm like, I'm like, Lord, like, I might, I might slip a little bit of a cuss word right there. Because I'm be like, like, I done ship, been shipwrecked. I almost cut right there. I've been shipwrecked. <laughs> ship. I've been shipwrecked all night. I finally float and I made it to the island. I'm sitting at this warm fire and you sent a, 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 a snake to bite me. Let me get my words right. Snake to bite me. So the snake bites him and the Bible says that all of them wait for Paul to drop dead. Paul shakes the snake off in the fire and he lives. But they saw that and saw that Paul actually was a man of God, that God was on his side. Now, here's what's so dope about this. After they see that, they start bringing everybody sick to Paul. Paul starts healing everybody. This is Acts chapter 20. I'm in 28. Made it 28. Everybody is getting, they are literally having a healing service on this island. And Paul sat there for three months and healed everybody. After he heals everybody, I'm ending here, y'all. After he heals everybody, he finally gets on the boat, on another boat, and he finally makes it to Rome. When he makes it to Rome, he's imprisoned. He never gets out of prison from Rome. 
in Rome. In fact, can y'all do me a favor? Uh, is anybody up there? Anybody up in there? Can y'all put those pictures up for me? Y'all putting those pictures up? This is, this is pictures when, when uh, Ty and I went to Rome a few weeks, a few weeks, a few years ago. That's the prison cell. Like, we took that with our, with our cell phone. That's the prison cell that Paul was in. He never made it out of the prison cell. In fact, history shows me that he was beheaded in the prison. Go to the next picture real quick. I just want to show y'all, if y'all look squint, that's Ty taking a picture while she's in Paul's cell. So not spiritual. So not spiritual. Paul died there, baby. You taking pictures. All right, so while Paul is there, I need you to pay attention. Paul is in a Roman jail cell. Oh, God, this makes me emotional, y'all. He writes Ephesians, he writes Philippians, he writes Colossians, he writes Philemon, he writes 2 Timothy. And here's what's so amazing. Two and a half centuries later, in Rome, which is a, y'all don't know how brutal Rome was. Two and a half centuries later, the emperor Constantine called an end to all persecution of Christians. 11 years after that, A.D. 324, Emperor Constantine confesses faith in Christ and made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in 324. Now, this is going to mess you up. All because the person that sat in jail still was sharing his faith. Now, his jail, that jail was like a house arrest almost because people were coming in and out. People were coming in and out. And I just want to read to you the last two verses because it lets you know what Paul was doing while he was in jail. It says he lived there for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with boldness and without hindrance. Y'all got to understand when we first met Paul, he was putting Christians in chains. He's now in chains preaching what he was putting people in jail for. This is what the power of the gospel will do. And what I love about Paul is the last letter Paul writes is 2 Timothy. That's the last. He doesn't write any letters after that. History shows me he's beheaded. He writes no other letters. I just want to read some of the words, and I'm going to pray and let y'all go. I want to read. This is where I got emotional. Knowing Paul sitting in a jail, complete life change, but planted churches and developed leaders and shared the gospel and healed the sick. He ends up in a jail And his last words was this, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, God but also all who loved his appearing. Here's my question. As we end this study of the book of Acts and we know that the continuation is you, will these be your last words? Will will this be how we end? Will our church be able to walk away from this thing and one day say, man, I poured out everything for the gospel. A lot of us are just coming to church, man. That's whack. A lot of us are just, we just here. We just profess in faith, but we ain't doing nothing. The devil is a liar. I want to be on fire the way Paul is on fire. I want to be able to end my journey. And two and a half centuries later, all of Brooklyn gets saved because of what you put into it. All of your neighborhood, your whole building, your whole family, great, 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 great grandkids get saved because of, this is, listen, we're not just here to sing some songs. We're not just here to put on a live stream and look at a logo. We are here to see the power of God reach this city. If I look at how every city that he went into was saved, every family that he touched was saved, just messes me up, y'all. You and I get to carry on what the apostles have started. We get to carry on what the church has started. And my question, I just, there's a real question I want to answer. Are you up for the challenge of the baton, baton being passed to you? Just want to answer. Are you up for it? Then let's run well. Let's run well. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the power 
that is in your church. Thank you for showing us tonight the movement of the gospel. I thank you, oh God, that this thing that started in Jerusalem, this thing that you did on Golgotha's hill, this thing has now actually reached the ends of the earth. And proof is us sitting in the room professing faith over your son, Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you. And as a church, as a church, oh God, and as a people, as individuals, we want to do well to run for you. Forgive us for being lazy Christians. You had people that died for the faith. You had people that were put in chains for the faith. You had people that were shipwrecked and beaten half dead for the faith. Lord, I pray, oh God, that we would do our part. Whatever our part is, I don't know what you have for us. I don't know what you want us to do. But I do know that the non-believing friends that we have, we're in their life for a reason. I do know you have us on that job for a reason. I do know that you have us living on that block for a reason. I do know that you have us at that gym for a reason. We go to that coffee shop for a reason. So, Lord, I pray, oh God, that you would stir us up. Stir us up. Get us on fire for you. Father, I'm over time, but, Lord, I, I just really believe that your word is true. And if your word is true, I know that we are Acts 29. We are Acts 30. We are Acts 40. So, Lord, I pray, oh God, that we would do this thing with the same vigor and power that we saw the church have. Give us boldness. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all, we done. Let me just quickly say I am looking forward to seeing y'all on Sunday. I, again, I am preaching on witches and warlocks. I, I really feel like I have a, a really clear assignment. And so um, I hope to see y'all. But we're ending. I love y'all. Grace and peace. Um, be well, y'all.